everybody, welcome to my channel and happy Halloween. So today we are doing a video on the case of Brittany Murphy and Brittany Murphy was an actress and there were some strange circumstances surrounding her death and we're gonna get into that. But first I wanna have a word from our sponsor. Today our sponsor is Function of Beauty. It's really hard to find hair care that's tailored and personalized to exactly what you need and what your hair type is. And just like our skin types, we all have different hair types. I'm a skincare freak, an addict. I love looking at a different kind of skincare. I love using different kinds of skincare to see what works best. But with hair care, I just don't know enough about it or really have the time and money to try a bunch of different things when most of them aren't going to work. And then if you spend a lot of money on a shampoo or a conditioner and it doesn't work for your hair, you're really not ever gonna wanna use it again because having a bad hair day is not fun. But Function of Beauty has a solution, a unique and personalized formula for your hair. Function of Beauty creates custom shampoo and conditioner for your hair type and your hair goals, and it's really easy. All you have to do is fill out a two-minute quiz outlining your hair type, your hair goals, your preferences, and you even get to choose your color and fragrance. Function of Beauty products have no parabens in them, no sulfates, no GMOs, no toxins, and they're 100% vegan and cruelty-free. I've been using Function of Beauty shampoo and conditioner for a while now, so I was really excited when they reached out to me to partner with me and sponsor a video. First of all, the process of going through a quiz and getting to pick exactly what you want your shampoo and conditioner to do and what your specific hair needs are was super fun to begin with because you kind of feel like you're legitimately creating your own shampoo and conditioner. I love the fact that you get to pick the colors and I love the fact that you get to pick the scent and you get to pick whether you want a, a strong scent or a medium scent or a light scent. And of course, I picked strong because I really enjoy when I can smell my own hair throughout the day. And typically with shampoo and conditioner, that's not a thing. You can smell it in the shower and you're like, this shampoo and conditioner smells awesome, but then later it just smells like hair. For my personal shampoo and conditioner, I picked two separate colors because I wear glasses and I'm blind in the shower, so I can't look and see which one says shampoo and which one says conditioner. This way I just know which color represents which and I can just grab it. But I picked purple for my shampoo and like this really cool charcoal gray for my conditioner. These are fairly new bottles. I've only been using these bottles for about a week and a half. And as always, I'm always gonna use a little bit more conditioner than I do shampoo because I wash my hair far less than I condition it because I have really curly hair that's prone to frizz up so the more I wash it the more frizzy it's gonna get but actually I have found using this shampoo I can use it a little bit more and because it doesn't have sulfates and parabens and all that jazz and it's not too stripping it doesn't really make my hair feel too clean and that may seem crazy because you're like why would your hair feel too clean but really I mean it doesn't strip out the natural oils which are gonna keep your hair shiny and, and not frizzy and the scent I chose, I think it's a special scent for fall, but it was pear. Oh my God, I love the smell of pears, guys. The smell of pears just brings me back to childhood and like happy days coming home from school. My mom cut a pear up for me for snack. I just love it. Oh my God. I also love that they come with pumps. Now you don't have to use the pumps. They also come with caps. So if you wanna travel with them, you can take the pumps out and put the caps back on because you know how hard it is to travel with bottles that have pumps. But I love the fact that it has a pump and I don't have to mess around with it and open the cap and you know, just drop it in the shower because I'm trying to open the cap and my hands are soapy. It's just really no muss, no fuss, and it's perfect for your hair, whatever hair type you have. They also send you these stickers that you can put on your bottles, which they're kind of like clear, except for like the color parts. So I don't like a ton of adornments on my things. I'm a pretty simple girl, but here I put a little pear on my conditioner because it smells like pear, and then this little plant. And then on this one, on the shampoo, I put a sticker that says good hair day. And then on the other side, like a little blow dryer, which is also purple, which I thought matched. I put way too much thought into it, but it was fun. It's fun to customize it. And on the side, it says function of a Harlequin. Oh my God, you can name it whatever you want. You can create the scent, the color, the formula, and then you can decorate the bottle and name it whatever you want, which is so cool. 
like I said, I've been using these products for a little while, so it was a couple months ago, people in my comment section started asking me, you know, your hair is getting really long. And right now, I mean, I, I kind of didn't straighten it completely, so it's not as long as it would be if I'd straightened it, but it's like down to the middle of my back. And I'm not taking any special vitamins. It's just really about good hair care and choosing hair care that's healthy for your hair and allows it to grow and be what it's supposed to be. So my profile was curly, coarse, and dry, which is exactly what my hair is. It's extremely curly, it's coarse, and it's very dry. And then the goals were anti-frizz, color protection, curl definition, deep condition, and shine. And obviously I dye my hair red. I wasn't born like this, unfortunately. I wish I was, but I dye my hair. So every, you know, three to four weeks, I'm dyeing my hair. It's red, you wanna keep that good, vivid red color. So you really want a shampoo and a conditioner that have color protection in them. So that's why I chose that. And obviously deep conditioning to prevent it from, you know, being dry. And the shine, shine's always important to me. And look at like how shiny my hair has been since I've been using these shampoos and conditioner. Like, it's just so, I feel like I'm talking about myself a lot right now, but it's so shiny and soft. I don't have any hairspray in my hair right now. I don't need to use hairspray to make it behave. I don't have to use these slick, like, sprays or oils. I used to use the Moroccan oil to bring the shine to my hair after I'd blow dry it, and I don't need to do that anymore. So I'm a real big fan of these products. Another cool thing about Function of Beauty is it's a subscription service, so you can kind of figure out how long it takes for you to go through a bio of shampoo or conditioner and then when you know you're gonna be out just have your new bottles set to arrive at your house at your doorstep no need to go online shopping and wait for it to get there no need to leave the house and go to the store anything that, that allows me to not leave the house and go to the store I'm a fan of I'm on board for so if you guys are interested in checking out Function of Beauty and being a part of creating your own hair care regimen click on the link in my description box and you'll get 20% off your first order Let's get started on the video. Thank you so much guys for watching the sponsor ad. As always, you know, we appreciate sponsors on this channel so, so much. And thank you to Function of Beauty for sponsoring this video and being such a really amazing company that makes vegan and cruelty-free products without any of these extra chemicals and stuff that's bad for your hair and gives us the, the fun time of being able to choose what goes into making our hair products. All right, let's get in. So the story of Brittany Murphy and what happened to her, it's a crazy story. And I kind of, once again, like so many of these videos that I chose to do for Halloween, I went in kind of thinking, there's really nothing to it. And then being just so intrigued by what I was finding out and understanding why people thought there was more to it than, than there actually was. So if you guys don't know Brittany Murphy, she was an actress. She was a really good kind of unrecognized actress or like underrated as far as I'm concerned. She's been in a lot of movies. Her most known role that kind of like brought her to the scene was Clueless where she starred with Alicia Silverstone and Stacey Dash. Such a good movie. One of my favorite movies. I loved that movie. I watched it so many times. I even had the soundtrack on a CD. She was in a lot of other amazing movies with a lot of really like high caliber actors and actresses. She was in uh, Girl Interrupted with Angelina Jolie. She was in Eight Mile with Eminem. She was the voice of Gloria from Happy Feet and that's where she actually got to show off her singing chops. She was the voice of Lou Anne from King of the Hill. She was a great actress and when she died, it was one of those Hollywood deaths that I really felt because I always thought I could relate to Brittany Murphy and I think a lot of girls did feel that way. She was kind of awkward, kind of goofy. It sometimes felt like, you know, she didn't fit in and she didn't belong. And I think a lot of us really kind of just connected with her on that. And so it was very sad when she died. But as always, to understand what happened at the end, we have to go back to the beginning. Brittany Murphy was born on November 10th, 1977, in Atlanta, Georgia, to her mother, Sharon Murphy, and her father, Angelo Bertolotti. According to Biography.com, Brittany's father was involved in some organized crime, and he was often in and out of prison. When she was two, her parents divorced, and she and her mother moved to Edison, New Jersey. 
From a very young age, Brittany was interested in acting and performing, and her mother enrolled her in Vern Fowler's School of Dance and Theater when she was five. When Brittany was 12, her mother began helping her to achieve her dream of being an actress by driving her to New York City for auditions, and within no time, she was being hired for commercial work. From there, she got small roles on popular sitcoms such as Boy Meets World and Murphy Brown. Encouraged by this, Sharon packed up their life in New Jersey and moved with her daughter to Burbank, California when Britney was 14. And like I said, her big break happened in 1995 when she was cast as Ty Frazier in the cult classic Clueless, which became this huge popular movie. After the success of this movie, Britney started to really get entrenched into the Hollywood life. She was getting the recognition as an actress. She got casted in Girl Interrupted, Drop Dead Gorgeous with Ellen Barkin, which is another cult classic. She had this wonderful way about her and she was beautiful and talented and she was really good in dramatic roles like Girl Interrupted and a mile, but she also had this quirky side which made her perfect for comedy roles. Which is where she eventually found her career going in the genre of rom-coms. Her first was Just Married with co-star Ashton Kutcher, followed by Uptown Girls with Dakota Fanning, and Little Black Book with Holly Hunter and Ron Livingston. Now I know Little Black Book was not the best movie that Brittany Murphy was in. In fact, I would say it's one of those that gets kind of forgotten when you think about the movies that she was in, but there's one scene in this movie where she's in her bathroom, she's wearing like underwear and a t-shirt and laying on the bathroom floor and she's singing Nobody Does It Better by Carly Simon. And she has this gorgeous, haunting voice, this, this singing voice that has a fragility and a vulnerability to it, but at the same time, real power and emotion. That scene in that movie really always stuck with me. I remember it to this day. I remember how much I loved hearing her voice singing that song. I remember looking to see if there was a full version of it somewhere that I could download and listen to. She was a really good actress. Her sense of comedic timing was perfect. Director Penny Marshall once said of Brittany Murphy, quote, her timing was impeccable. She could be funny, she could be dramatic. She was a terrific actress. As she rose to fame in Hollywood, her personal life was a little bit of a roller coaster. She dated comedian Tom Green for a while. She dated her Eight Mile co-star Eminem for a while. She dated her co-star Ashton Kutcher from Just Married for a little while. She was engaged to a producer named Jeff Quatinitz. I'm pretty sure I said his name wrong. And she was also engaged to a man named Joe Malcuso for a year. She was rumored to have a thing with Limp Biscuit frontman Fred Durst after they were spotted at the Four Seasons in LA together. So she was searching, you know, she was searching for a relationship that she could call her own. But it seemed as if Hollywood got to her, as it does so many other young actors and actresses. She struggled with body image issues, which the director of Clueless, Amy Heckerling, believes started on the set of that movie. Brittany Murphy was never heavy by any stretch of the imagination, but when she, when she got a part in Clueless, she was starring across from two very beautiful, very thin, already kind of seasoned actresses, and that's Alicia Silverstone and Stacey Dash. I mean, these girls had already been in the business for a little while and kind of knew what the look was and what they were supposed to be portraying, especially at that time. Society's image of what was beautiful was pretty much stick thin in the 90s. You also have the fact that Britney was cast as, as Ty, this character who was supposed to be the ugly duckling, who was supposed to be a little bit more awkward and needed a makeover from the other girls. So it would have probably affected her self-esteem as a young girl who wasn't used to how savage Hollywood can be. So maybe that part that she was cast in Ty, the awkward girl, the outsider, who needed to be improved physically in order to fit in with the other girls, hit a little close to home for her. When she emerged in 2002, looking drastically different, slimmer, and blonder, obviously rumors began to circulate. The tabloids and the paparazzi speculated that she was using drugs and or had an eating disorder. She went on the record saying that she'd never used drugs and she was the same size as she had been when she was in the movie Clueless. She said, quote, it's just the weight in your face changes as you grow and get older. This is my body. I'm proud of it. I'm healthy. 
Friends close to the actress confirmed that she did have body image issues and that she was extremely self-conscious. They said she wore a lot of makeup, dyed her hair blonde, lost weight, and got her teeth capped because she wanted to emulate what Hollywood thought of as beautiful. She didn't want to be that fat girl from Clueless. These sources claim they never saw her eat a lot. She just drank a ton of coffee. Now for the record, before y'all attack me in the comments, I'm not saying she was the fat girl from Clueless. That was just, that was taken out of an article. Obviously, in today's society, I'm so happy that we've kind of evolved as far as body positivity and body image go. Because really, we have girls now that are modeling and acting and on the runway that are actually setting an example to young girls that there's no right or wrong when it comes to being beautiful. You have have girls who are modeling now who are a size zero, you have girls who are modeling who are size 16. The number on your dress or your jeans doesn't dictate whether or not you're beautiful. And I love that even though as a society we haven't evolved in some ways, we have definitely evolved in that way. Which is, I mean, really good for me because because I'm not a skinny girl by any means, you know. I got a big butt, I have a chest, I got some curves, so I definitely never felt like I fit in in the 90s when everybody was just trying to lose as much weight as possible. But now I'm like, yeah, I can eat that donut because it's okay to have a butt and have hips. We no longer feel that it's necessary to shame women who are too thin or too curvy, even though it does still happen sometimes, I do have to say. I, I see that it happens sometimes, but as a society, I think that we, we are much more open-minded about what's acceptable for a woman to look like, even though that should be none of our business. But it seemed as Britney's career was kind of taking a downturn because after a couple rom-coms, she kind of got typecasted. She wanted to do more serious acting work. She wanted to do something more creative, more kind of like independent. And, you know, she kind of got typecast and then she wasn't really getting any good movies. She wasn't getting any high-paying movies. She was kind of just being thrown into these B-list movies. And as an A-list actress, because I really believe that she had the acting chops and just everything it took to be considered an A-list actress. She was being shoved into these really bad roles that, that weren't good for her and weren't good for her career. But as her career seemed to be kind of taking a downturn, her personal life seemed to be looking up. She met a British screenwriter named Simon Monjak, and after what seemed like a very fast relationship, they were married in a private Jewish ceremony on May of 2007. Monjak didn't have a ton of movies under his belt. He had a story credit for the 2006 movie Factory Girl, based on the life of Edie Sedgwick, and is also credited as the writer and director and producer of a relatively unknown British drama called Two Days, Nine Lives. How the two met and embarked on a relationship is still a little confusing. There's different accounts, there's different stories. She was engaged to Joe Malcuso, a production assistant on the movie Little Black Book, and her engagement to Simon happened only months after that one was called off. Either way, Brittany told family and friends that she was blissfully in love with Simon and very happy. The couple occupied a home in the Hollywood Hills that had previously been owned and lived in by Britney Spears and Justin Timberlake. Britney's mother lived there with them. It seemed as if Britney and her mother Sharon were incredibly close and had a very tight bond. Sharon once said that to call them best friends would have been minimizing their actual bond and their relationship. And this is pretty normal, I think, when a daughter's raised by a single mother you know, Sharon was pretty much all Britney had from the time she was two and she helped her get to LA and she helped her start her career and she supported her. And in 2004, when Sharon was diagnosed with breast cancer, Britney was her constant companion. She cared for her, she took care of her, and she supported her. So I love this whole life cycle. You know, Sharon was a hardworking single mother, took care of Britney, raised her, kind of turned her life, her own life, upside down in order to give her daughter everything she wanted. And then when Sharon later came upon bad times, it was Brittany who was able to be there for her and put her life on hold to care for her mother and, and be there for her. So I, I love seeing that. And it's really no wonder to me that the two were so very close. But there was a lot going on behind the scenes in Britney's life. She hadn't had a studio picture since Little Black Book, and she didn't feel like she was being offered pictures that would showcase her talent and her creativity as an actress. 
Six weeks before her death, Brittany, her little Maltese puppy that she called Clara, Simon, and Sharon all flew together to San Juan, Puerto Rico, where Brittany was going to be starring in a low-budget thriller film called The Caller. This project would be short-lived as she walked off the set after only one day of filming. Press releases later would report that she'd been kicked off, that her husband Simon had been irrationally drunk on the set, and she'd come to his defense when they tried to remove him, so she was basically fired. Later, after being contacted by Simon Monjack's attorneys, the studio changed their position and printed a retraction saying that it had been a mutual parting. Now, Sharon and Simon, Brittany's mother and a husband, claimed after her death that before she died, they'd all three been talking about leaving LA altogether and moving to New York City. Apparently, Brittany hated the house. There was just something about it that unsettled her, and every time they'd be driving home, she'd say she didn't want to go home and ask if they could check into a hotel instead. According to her mother and her husband, Brittany wanted to leave LA, leave the lights and the cameras and the you know critical eyes of everybody, leave them all behind, move to New York City, and start a family with Simon. But unfortunately, for the 32-year-old actress, that would never happen. On the morning of December 20th, Brittany woke up and complained about stomach pains. She went into the bathroom at about 7.30 a.m. and was found 30 minutes later, passed out on the floor. Sharon and Simon tried to revive her by getting her into the shower and turning the water on, but when she began to throw up, Sharon called 911. Brittany was quoted as saying, Mommy, I can't catch my breath. Help me, before passing out. Fire Department 97 was the address of the emergency. 1895 Rising Glen Road. What's the phone number you're calling from? Three. Tell me exactly what happened. Oh, somebody's passed out. Somebody what? Oh, somebody's, my daughter's passed out. She's, she's, they're doing, doing mouth to mouth. Please get oh, here oh, quick, okay. please. Okay, okay. All right, we're going to. How old is your daughter? She's 30. Please help. She's 30? Okay, she's with you now? Yes, there's someone coming. Yeah, ma'am, you don't have to yell. We're going to send somebody out there, okay? Please. Is she awake? Please, no. Is she breathing? No. Okay, so somebody's doing mouth to mouth? Yes. Okay, all right. Did, ma'am, did somebody see what happened? No. no. Okay, listen to me carefully. Is there a defibrillator available? <laughs> Is there a defibrillator available? Defibrillator, do we have any? No. Okay, listen to me carefully. We're on our way. I'm going to give you instructions. Are you right by her now? Yes, yes. Are, are you right by her now? Yes, her husband Okay, listen is. carefully. I want you to lay her on her back. She is already. On the floor. She is already. And no pillows under the head. Remove any pillows. Is there any, okay? No pillows under the head. No, no pillows under the head. Okay. okay. Now, I want you to take a look inside of her mouth. Is there anything? Kneel next to her and look inside her, her mouth and check for food or she vomit. She up tons of stuff. Is tons there? and tons of water. Okay, turn her to the Cold side. Water. Cold turn her to the side and wipe out her mouth and nose. Is, wipe out her mouth and nose. Is there anything in her mouth? Yes. Is there anything in her mouth now? Oh, my God. Is there anything in her mouth? God. Is there anything in her mouth, ma'am? I don't think so. Okay, <laughs> listen to me carefully. Place your hand on her forehead. And your other hand under her neck and tilt her head back. Place your hand under her forehead, the other hand on your neck and tilt her head back. Put your ear next to her mouth. Put your ear next to her mouth. Can you feel or hear any breathing? Can you feel or hear any breathing? <laughs> Can you feel or hear any breathing? <laughs> yes or no, ma'am? Hello? 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 Just a minute, please. It just takes a, a second. Can you feel or hear any breathing? Did you hear anything, Simon? Yes or no? Yes or no? No. Okay, all right. Listen to me carefully. I'm going to tell you how to do compressions, okay? okay. 600 times, okay? Just keep doing compressions, okay, until help can take over. <laughs> Let the chest come all the way up between pumps. Count it, Count out loud so I can I can count with you, okay? Count out loud. I want to hear. It's, it's got to be at this rate, like one, one two, 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 three, four, four five, five, six, seven, eight. Nine. Keep going at that rate. Eight. Nine. That's too slow. Ten, That's too slow. Seven, too slow. Okay, he's going. You're, you're it's got to be a little count faster count than that. He's so, counting every other pump. But he's got to count each pump. One, two. Pump. Pump. Count them out here. Each pump. Count each pump. <laughs> Is the door open, ma'am? Is the door open? Um, no. I'll go get it. 
<laughs> we have to open the gate. Okay, you, he, somebody has to keep pumping on her chest. Okay, he is. That he can stop, okay? Stop it, he doesn't stop. And count them out loud so I can count with you. Count out loud, uh, okay. I don't hear, I can't hear him, ma'am. He's pumping, he's not counting anymore, he's pumping, trust me. Okay, but I need to know where, how, where he's at about. What number are you at, honey? Clara, what number is daddy at? <laughs> ma'am, ma'am, ma'am. Okay, he's got to count out loud so I can I mean, hear. He's probably at 200. No, he's probably like at about 100 right now. <laughs> so take him to keep pumping. It's got to be 1, <laughs> 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Three, I don't hear him five, pumping, ma'am. 6, 7, that's the rhythm. 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 3, 4, 5, that, six, That's seven. a little too quick, ma'am. Oh, no, that's a little too quick. Ma'am, I can't hear him okay. pumping. I need to know where he's at, okay? Oh, <laughs> A lot of speculation online about this this phone call to 911. Some people say Sharon seemed really panicked at times, almost as if she couldn't even vocalize or verbalize what she needed to get out. And then there was other times right after where she seemed eerily calm. By the time Brittany was rushed to the hospital, it was too late. She was pronounced dead at 10.04 a.m. and she was laid to rest on Christmas Eve in a twilight ceremony at Forest Lawn Memorial Park in the Hollywood Hills. Her family released a statement afterwards saying, a bright light that lit the world is forever dimmed, but it will live on in the hearts of those Brittany touched. Before the autopsy or toxicology reports came back, it was discovered that there was 10 different prescription medications in the house of Brittany Murphy, which obviously led to the rumors and the speculation and the reports that she'd died from a drug overdose or an eating disorder. Simon made a public statement saying that these rumors were crazy. He said she's quite slim, but that's her natural physique. He also said she was on natural herbal remedies that wouldn't speed up her heart and that there was nothing in their house that would have harmed her. He said there was some prescription medicine in the house for her female time, some cough syrup, and that was it. At the time of her death, Brittany was about 5'2 and 115 pounds. And this is actually considered to be an average weight for her height, but it can be denied that over the years, Brittany Murphy did appear to lose quite a bit of weight. Initially, at the hospital, when it was first discovered that Brittany had passed away, Simon Monjack, her husband, had not wanted an autopsy done, but he was overruled by the coroner. And that was definitely suspicious, but we're going to talk more about Simon Monjack in a little bit as well. The autopsy was done on December 21st by the coroner. He attributed the death to be from community-acquired pneumonia. Under contributing factors is listed iron deficiency anemia and multiple drug intoxication. He summarized that there was no evidence of trauma. The circumstances claim that she had a history of diabetes and she'd been previously hospitalized for an episode of hypoglycemia. There's no history of alcohol or drug abuse, but she did have a history of mitral valve prolapse, which is a very common and treatable heart condition that she was diagnosed with when she was a teen. In the autopsy, we do see in the notes that while they were in Puerto Rico, both Simon and Sharon had become ill, but Brittany had not gotten sick while in Puerto Rico because they didn't just stay that one day while they were in Puerto Rico and, you know, go and, and film the movie and then get kicked off the set and go home. They actually stayed, I think, 10 or 15 days to just have a vacation because that's how long they had planned to be in Puerto Rico anyways. So they stayed and they hung out and they had a vacation. And while they were there, both Simon and Sharon got sick, but Brittany did not. The opinion of the autopsy was that she had acute pneumonia consistent with a community-acquired infection. 
the organism that likely caused this pneumonia was caused by oxacillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. I know I said the, the Staphylococcus word wrong. I don't know. I know how it's pronounced, but for some reason, my brain and my tongue just don't ever want to say that word right. So anyways, oxacillin is a penicillin antibiotic that's commonly used to treat staph infections, but this specific infection was resistant to oxacillin, and when her blood cultures were checked, she had this infection in her system. The anemia would have caused her to feel weak, tired, short of breath, and these were symptoms that she described having in the weeks leading up to her death. The anemia would have also caused her to be more susceptible to that infection or really any infection. The report claims that the second contributing factor was the amount of prescription medicine in her system. There were elevated levels of hydrocodone, acetaminophen, and chlorophenrim. L-methamphetamine was also present. The report points out that L-methamphetamine is not an illegal drug, unlike D-methamphetamine, which is used as a street drug, which is speed, and it can often be found in over-the-counter inhalers. The drugs in her system looked as if they were used by someone who was trying to treat a cold. So they basically just decided that Brittany was feeling sick. She'd most likely caught the bug that Sharon and Simon had had when they were in Puerto Rico, and because of the anemia, she just wasn't strong enough to fight it off, which led to pneumonia, which led to her death. And that on its own, obviously, it doesn't seem mysterious. It's tragic and sad. She was so young. She had so much potential. She had so much in her future. She wanted to start a family, and she lost all of that. But there's obviously nothing too suspicious here. The coroner's report makes sense. However, less than five months later, her husband, Simon Monjack, would die in the same house, in the same bathroom, in pretty much the same way. He was found dead on May 23rd at the age of 39, and the autopsy revealed that his death was caused from acute pneumonia with a contributing factor of severe anemia. Obviously, this caused a lot of speculation about the connection between the two deaths of two young people in such similar ways. Initially, Sharon claimed that the house was filled with toxic mold, which had caused both her daughter and son-in-law to fall sick and die. But the house was checked for mold, as well as any other environmental factors that could have led to their deaths, and none were found. The coroner insisted that toxic mold was not a factor in the deaths, but it appears that Sharon did sue the builders of the house and settled in 2013 for $600,000. Then Brittany's father, Angelo, comes out of the woodwork. Now it seems, according to Sharon, that the two, Brittany and Angelo, they'd never been very close and he'd only started making an effort to be a part of Brittany's life when she started making a lot of money. It's very clear when you hear Sharon talk about Angelo that she wasn't a big fan of the way that he had tried to insert himself into Brittany's life and then into her death. Angelo and this other woman named Julia Davis started making allegations that Britney's death and Simon's death were products of government interference, essentially that they'd been killed off and now it was all being covered up. Now this is a crazy story, but bear with me. If you look up Julia Davis now, she's listed as a government whistleblower, but she didn't start out that way. She came to the US from the USSR and started out in Hollywood doing some stunt double work, even acting as a stunt double for Angelina Jolie. She got married to an American who was also part of the Hollywood scene, and his name was BJ, which is such a, a Hollywood name. You know, like, if you're a talent scout or a movie producer, you're like, hey, I'm BJ Sparks. You know, it just seems like such a Hollywood name. His last name wasn't Sparks. I just made that up. Apparently, Julia wanted a change of pace, so she ended up getting a job as a Customs and Border Protection Officer at the San Ysidro Port of Entry, the largest and busiest land border crossing in the U.S. and in the world. They'd already been notified that on July 4th, 2004, the government was expecting some terrorist organizations to attempt to enter the U.S. using the U.S.-Mexico borders. So the border protection officers were put on high alert. Sure enough, on July 4th, Julia witnessed 23 individuals from countries that were on a list of high alert places being essentially waved through the border with protocol being ignored. They weren't being fingerprinted, their papers weren't being checked, etc. When Julia tried to alert her bosses about this break in protocol, she was fired and then retaliated against. She claims that herself, her friends, and her family were subjected to land and aerial surveillance. Wiretaps, warrantless search and seizures, just the whole nine when you're being, you know, intimidated by the government. 
She also claims that Brittany Murphy was a good friend of hers who publicly spoke out about the way that Julia was being treated by the government and as a result, Brittany and her husband Simon were placed on the FBI watch list and they were also put under surveillance. So Julia and Angela, they went public and they said that Brittany and Simon were essentially poisoned by the government for their support of Julia. Angelo claimed that he had obtained a sample of his daughter's hair from the coroner and that he'd had it tested at a private lab. According to Angelo, because of the way that Brittany and Simon had been acting before they died, he asked this lab to test for heavy metals. Allegedly, the results came back positive for 10 heavy metals at levels above the World Health Organization high levels recommendations. The report concluded that the only logical explanation would be an exposure to these metals, toxins, administrated by a third party perpetrator with likely criminal intent. Usually I like to wait till the end of the video to give my, my opinions, but this is a little ridiculous to me and I guess I don't know how private toxicology labs work, but I just feel like the, the lab's job is to kind of test the hair and then give the results, not to give like their opinion on how the heavy metals may have, have been found in the hair or been present there. I've never seen that happen, but let me know if I'm wrong, guys. This whole story of Angelo getting a sample of Brittany's hair from the coroner and then having it tested in a private lab and specifically asking them to test for heavy metals because of how Brittany and Simon had been acting, which like how does one act when they're being poisoned by heavy metals? And specifically asking them to test for that and then all of a sudden it comes back and they're like, whoa, these levels are so high of heavy metals in her hair. It just seems too perfect, too suspicious to me. It seems like, I don't know, it's shady. And can you imagine a lab saying like the only possible way that these toxins could have gotten into our system was from a third party perpetrator with criminal intentions? It's not very scientific to say this is the only way that this could possibly happen. The only logical explanation is she's poisoned by the government. That's not very scientific or professional, but there was many other ways heavy metals could be found in Brittany's system or in her hair, especially hair dye being one because Brittany had her hair dyed quite often and hair dye has heavy metals in it. Now, Julia Davis and her husband, they made a movie about this, a documentary, if you will. It's called Top Priority and this documentary or movie or whatever you wanna call it, it alleges that Simon Monjak had been under threat of being deported by the United States government and that the Department of Homeland Security had made these false claims that Brittany Murphy, before she died, had spoken out against Julia. So like withdrawn her support or basically condemned her actions. Julia Davis said, quote, Britt and her husband Simon didn't deserve to be terrorized by the Department of Homeland Security for standing up to defend me. Brit. The film also claims that both Brittany and Simon feared and thought that they were being watched by helicopters and that their phones were bugged. Journalist Ben Brock claims that Simon had approached him, worried about being under surveillance and concerned about, you know, being watched, and a few days later, his wife was dead. The film's director, Asif Akbar, Julia Davis, and Angelo have all teamed up again, allegedly to write and produce a biopic called Brit about the actress's life, including her childhood, her rise to fame, her romances, and her untimely death, which is kind of ironic considering her father wasn't even around for much of her life, but I suspect it's some kind of competition with her mother who helped Lifetime create a movie about Britney's life. And speaking of Sharon, what does she think about Angelo and Julia Davis's claims about this being some kind of government conspiracy and cover-up? She claims her daughter never even met Julia Davis. She said, quote, I am quite confident Brittany never cooperated with Julia Davis, never signed any statement in support of her, never met with her, and barely knew she existed. Savage, Sharon. Wow, that's cold. Sharon says that Julia Davis did attempt to contact Brittany once, but all Julia got in return was a letter from Brittany's agent saying that Brittany didn't know anything about Julia's claims and she would not be meeting with her. Julia Davis thinks that Sharon is lashing out at her because of Julia's affiliation with Sharon's ex-husband, Angelo, who Sharon hates. 
Whether or not you believe this crazy story from Julia and Angelo in parts or in its whole, I have a hard time believing anything that comes from anyone who's trying to profit off of the death of somebody. Especially when this project, whether it be a movie or a book, contains allegations that the other person can no longer confirm or deny. So there's a good chance that Julia never met Brittany, never knew her, never spoke to her. But when she died, she saw an opportunity to use this woman whose life was over to further her own cause. Whether or not she convinced Angelo that she actually did know Brittany, or whether Angelo's just along for the ride to make some money, I don't know. But either way, I think it's pretty scummy if that's what's going on. There is no evidence that exists that shows Julia and Brittany knew each other. She hasn't been able to produce any photographs or any correspondence, so I think it's very likely that Julia Davis never knew Brittany at all and just used her death as a way to further her cause. But this is not the end of this strange case. It seems like Brittany and Simon may have had a little bit of an unhealthy relationship dynamic. They've been referred to as constant companions, best friends, soulmates. They were almost codependent on each other. And when I say almost, like I'm pretty sure they were. When Simon first showed up on her arm, everyone wondered who he was. He was certainly not her usual type. He was almost eight years her senior, and many people commented on his physical appearance. Which I think is wrong because love is blind and if someone makes you happy, it doesn't matter if they look like every other guy or girl you've dated before or if, you know, people think that he's not as attractive as you are or she's not as attractive as you are. It's, I don't, I don't agree with that, but I can see why people made the comments. I mean, you go from Ashton Kutcher to Simon Monjack and, and there's some, there's some questions there. But you know, whatever, if someone makes you happy, if he treats you like gold, if you feel like you can be your true and best self with them, who cares? However, there are some reports that he did not treat her like gold. By those in Hollywood who didn't like him or who had had bad run-ins with him, he was referred to as Simon Konjak. It appears that he had gotten a number of lawsuits and put himself into quite a bit of debt before meeting and marrying Brittany Murphy. Additionally, his visa was about to expire in February of 2007, and that might have explained their quick engagement and hasty wedding. He had been married before, and his ex-wife alleged that he had not paid her the $50,000 that she was owed after successfully suing him. The director of Factory Girl, George Hickenlooper, claimed that Simon had nothing to do with the movie. Simon had insisted that his name be on the credits after making a bogus legal claim that the script had been stolen from him. Hickenlooper said, quote, He held us hostage and we were forced to settle with him as he held our production over a barrel. People claimed that whenever Simon was around, Brittany would kind of turn silent and withdrawn. She could be in a great mood and friendly and bubbly. And, you know, you see her in interviews. She was this really, like, bubbly person. And she was kind of an oddball. And she just had this great electric energy about her. But when he would walk into the room, she would quiet down and kind of withdraw from the group. There were reports that Simon had also insisted on doing her makeup for a movie she was in in 2009, which everybody, including me, thought was very odd. Because it's like you're not a makeup artist, you know? There's like specialized people for that, especially when it's a movie. You know, you're a producer, you're a writer, whatever you are, you're not a makeup artist. So, so I don't know if it was because he wanted her makeup done in a certain way or if he just wanted to feel as if he was a part of the movie or contributing something, I'm not sure. Whenever she was on set on a movie, he would want to be there, just sitting there and watching. And the two became incredibly withdrawn together. They seemed to kind of transfer personalities and anxieties and phobias and worries and fears between themselves. So if Simon was afraid of something, within no time, Brittany would become afraid of that as well and vice versa. Like they were just these two really paranoid people who kind of became afraid of their own shadow, didn't leave the house a lot, and just spent time together inside the house. They didn't socialize a lot with others and they practiced holistic medicine, which a lot of people say is the reason that Brittany did not go to the doctor when she was feeling sick because she'd been feeling sick for weeks before she died. And she hadn't gone to the doctor. And a lot of people say that Simon didn't allow her to because what they practiced was holistic medicine. So herbal remedies and, you know, all natural remedies and things like that. And sometimes people who are really focused on holistic medicine and natural healing, they don't believe in doctors or they don't like to go 
to the doctor. So a lot of people do claim that the reason she put off going to the doctor so long, even though eventually at the end she was feeling so bad she had made a doctor's appointment, which ended up just being a few days after she died. In 2006, Simon was sued for $470,000 and there are two outstanding arrests in his name in the state of Virginia for alleged credit card fraud. Between 1997 and 2006, he was evicted from four homes. Many people approached Brittany when she started seeing him to warn her, but she wouldn't hear it. After her death, Monjack launched the Brittany Murphy Foundation and began planning a fundraiser with ticket prices ranging from $1,000 to $10,000. After it emerged that he had not registered the foundation as an actual legitimate charity, he promised to return all donations. The fundraiser was canceled due to health reasons. And almost immediately after her death, Monjack began planning a tell-all book about his dead wife. Sources at the hospital where Brittany was taken when she died described Monjack as being spaced out, as if he was disconnected from the situation around him. An eyewitness claimed he was visibly on a lot of medication. In a statement made to the Daily News, Simon Monjack said, quote, My problem is that I do not look like Ashton Kutcher, nor do they like the fact that she married someone who was not famous. Here, stars like stars to marry other stars. I don't necessarily know if that's true. There's a lot of high profile stars who married, you know, just everyday people, just mere mortals like the rest of us. So I asked Siri to look it up for us. George Clooney, his wife is a, a human rights lawyer, so she's not a, a movie star. Joseph Gordon-Levitt, he married a robotics entrepreneur named Tasha McCauley in 2015. I had no idea. Why does it break my heart that Joseph Gordon-Levitt is married? Because I love him. Ellen Pompeo from Grey's Anatomy, she married just a regular guy. Well, he's a music producer, I guess. Reese Witherspoon is married to a man named Toth. And he's a talent agent, but he's just, you know, a regular guy. Um, even though I don't know if that counts because Reese Witherspoon was married previously. Wasn't she married to Ryan Phillippe? So he was like a big star. So this is kind of her second marriage. So most likely she would just be like, whatever, I'm going to do whatever I want now. Patrick Dempsey, mega dreamy from Grey's Anatomy. He married a hairstylist and a makeup artist. Meryl Streep married a sculptor. Zoe Saldana married an artist. Tina Fey married a composer. Anne Hathaway married a jewelry designer. Paul Rudd married a former publicist. Jon Stewart married a vet tech. I mean, yeah, is it more like popular, I guess, for big stars to be in relationships with other big stars because then they get more like tabloid time and they get more screen time and it's a big thing that like connects the public with them as a couple, especially if they were in a movie together previously, like, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Smith with Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, like that was a huge thing. Yeah, it happens, but I don't think necessarily that the people in Hollywood are proud pressuring everybody that, that's a part of Hollywood or a part of like A-list celebrities to marry other celebrities. I don't know if that's a thing. Obviously, I'm not a movie star, so I don't have firsthand knowledge. But, but he claims that everybody was talking crap about him because he wasn't a big star. And, and that's why, you know, they, they spread these nasty rumors about him. But like I said, all these other people... And many people for years and years have married outside of Hollywood and nobody's like spreading rumors about their spouses. So I don't know if he had any leg to stand on there. Add to that the fact that the day she died, Simon told the hospital he didn't want an autopsy done. He said he couldn't bear to think about her being cut open. But he only said the thing about not being able to think about her being cut open later when he was asked to explain why he'd tried to deny an autopsy. So who knows if that's the real reason. Additionally, in Britney's will, she left everything to her mother, Sharon, nothing to Simon. And it's strange for Britney, who told people she was so in love with Simon and who defended him every chance that she could, to completely write him out of her will and leave everything to her mother. Especially considering that Britney knew her money was bankrolling their lives together. Simon, not only did he owe a lot of money to a lot of people, but he, he didn't have any work going on. He wasn't producing anything or writing anything. He wasn't really bringing in a ton of money. So the majority of the money that they would have used as a married couple to survive and live was from Britney. So she knew he wasn't flush or she wouldn't have thought he'd be okay if she died and, you know, didn't leave him any money. 
So there's certainly underlying facts to this case, things we don't know, things that happened behind closed doors that we will probably never know. And it certainly does have an air of drama and mystery to it, but in my opinion, the story of two young, relatively healthy people just dropping dead for no reason of the same thing in the same place, it was a little bit exaggerated. Simon Monjak had significant health issues before his death. It was said that he would have seizures that were so violent, Brittany would have to get on top of him in bed and hold him down and put a spoon in his mouth so he wouldn't bite his own tongue. On the plane back from Puerto Rico, six weeks before her death, Simon had gotten very sick on the plane and they'd had to detour and bring him to the hospital. He called it an asthma attack when asked about it, but his own mother said that it was a mild heart attack. He'd told family members that he had an issue with a leaky heart valve that he'd had to have triple bypass surgery to correct. He only had one kidney, and at the time when he was having these seizures and going through all of these health problems, Brittany was helping him and taking care of him and making sure that he wasn't biting his own tongue off and he'd have these seizures in bed next to her and she'd have to crawl on top of him. And I mean, he was about 400 pounds and she was 115 pounds. So I just can imagine little Brittany, you know, crawling on top of big Simon and trying to hold him down and prevent him from, you know, hurting himself while he's having this seizure. And it, it does make sense to me a little bit why they may have been so codependent then maybe she felt like he needed her for so much. He needed her for financial assistance. Maybe he needed her to stay in the country and he needed her medically to help care for him. So in Simon's system, there was a wide array of medications. He had Celexa, Cymbalta, and Deserol, which are three different types of antidepressants, Valium and Ativan for anti-anxiety, Vicodin, Lyrica, and Tylenol, all analgesics, and finally Indorol, an antihypertensive agent. So not that all these medicines, you know, would have necessarily contributed to him him dying, but it kind of gives you an idea of what kind of mind frame he was in, what kind of emotional state he was in. He was on three different antidepressants, anti-anxiety medicine. Lyrica, I believe, is a medicine for nerve pain, so a lot of people with fibromyalgia take it. Um, then you've got the antihypertensive agent, which probably was to lower his blood pressure, so he wasn't in a great physical or mental place when his wife died and he may have felt scared or depressed, not only losing who he called his soulmate, but now he's kind of in a financial position where he doesn't have control over any of her money. Sharon has all the money, and him and Sharon still lived in the house together after Brittany died, which did cause some rumors, especially when they were photographed together, that they were having an affair or sleeping together, that maybe they'd been sleeping together before Brittany died and that they were sleeping together after she died. There was some sort of, um, I forget what article it was, but it was a news article that said um, when Sharon was explaining how Simon had died, because she was the one who found him when he died, when she was explaining how she found him, she was in his bedroom because the bathroom was attached to the master bedroom. And she described one side of the bed as my side of the bed. Now, I don't know if this was true or if this was just a fabrication that the magazine came up with, um, but there was definitely lots of speculation and rumors going on. And I do think it's a little strange for them to continue living together Together after Brittany's gone, but maybe they had a really close relationship as well that wasn't, you know, them sleeping together, that they just had like a mother and son relationship. So those are just rumors. Obviously, I have no proof that Simon Monjack and, you know, Brittany Murphy's mom had an affair, but, you know, it is, it is speculated out there and I just thought I'd throw it in there. But what do you guys think? When I heard that they'd been in Puerto Rico five weeks before she died, I'd never heard that before on any of the videos or podcasts that I listened to about this case. And um, it, it kind of made me think because remember I made a video of Coffee and Crime Time a couple of months ago about like what's going on in the Dominican Republic. A lot of people are going to stay there at all-inclusive resorts and then either dying or coming home very sick and the doctors can't figure out what it is. Some people think it's um, tainted alcohol or contaminated alcohol, but we, do, we don't really know. And in Puerto Rico, there's something similar going on. You know, people are getting sick, they're vomiting, they have chills, body aches, they feel really sick, and then they go to the doctors and the doctor can't figure it out. And I also wonder if it has something to do with the um, pesticides that 
that they use in Puerto Rico because there's been a big thing about pesticides being used in Puerto Rico or how pesticides have been used in Puerto Rico before that are really not safe for humans and they're being used around humans and people are getting sick. So I almost wonder if it had something to do with something that happened in Puerto Rico and it was just not able to be detected by an autopsy, just like the stuff that was going on in the Dominican Republic. When these people died, they weren't able to figure out what caused it. So I definitely think that they all got something when they were in Puerto Rico. And Brittany just happened to get it five weeks later, which is kind of a long time, but she had been feeling sick for a few weeks leading up to that, and maybe she'd been feeling sick even longer, but she just hadn't said anything. She didn't want to burden anybody. Who knows? Simon's death almost five months later, though, does strike me as odd because if he was sick in Puerto Rico and then Brittany died five weeks later and then he died five months later from, you know, similar things, which was the pneumonia and the contributing factor of anemia, why did it take so long for it to hit him hard enough to, you know, end his life? This is definitely weird. It's definitely one of those crazy kinds of things that probably has a reasonable explanation and a logical explanation, but we just don't know it. <laughs> but let me know what you guys think. Is this a government conspiracy? Does Julia Davis's story hold any water at all? I haven't watched the documentary that, that they made about it. I really wish I could, but it's like super hard to find. It's not definitely a mainstream thing to watch. I just don't believe it, guys. I don't know why. There's just something about the way everything went down. I don't believe her. And listen, I'm the first person to question the government or to question authority. I enjoy doing that just because it makes me feel like I'm still thinking and I'm not just accepting things blindly. But there's just something about this story of hers it doesn't add up. And like I said, pieces of it could be true, but I believe there's a lot of pieces that aren't true. And, you know, I would just uh, in encourage her or invite her to show any proof that she knew Brittany Murphy at all before Brittany died. And then maybe I'll consider it. The fact that Brittany and Simon alleged that they thought they were being, you know, put under surveillance before they died. Like I said, these were two people who had become very codependent on each other. They'd become very paranoid and it could have just been a result of that. Additionally, one of the, the reporter or the journalist that Simon allegedly said that to, I believe that he's working with Julia and Angelo and all these people on a new book. So he could just once again have a financial interest in, in making the story seem real. Oh, either way, guys, let me know what you think in the comments. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing Halloween with me. Before we go, I just have some birthday Patreon shout outs because I was very, very bad last month. And because I was so busy um, doing research for Halloween, I completely forgot to shout out my September birthday Patreons, my September Patreon birthdays. Either way, I think it works either way, right? So I'm gonna do that now. And then, you know, from here on, I'll go with the October ones. Okay, Amanda McMahon Nogoria had her birthday on September 10th. Emily had her birthday on September 4th and she just turned 21 and then she had to get her tonsils taken out on the 19th. So let's send Emily all our healing energy. Clary T's birthday was on September 18th. A shout out to Clary T, I always see you in the comments. Anna Elizabeth had her birthday on September 4th as well. So Anna and Emily share a birthday. Alex Beginski, who I always see in the comments and is super funny on Twitter, she had a birthday on September 6th. Happy birthday, Alex. Dana Hood had her birthday on September 30th, which actually, because I'm pre-recording this, hasn't happened yet, so I'm not too late. And Brie Barker had her birthday on September 29th, also hasn't happened yet, and it is my wedding anniversary, so happy birthday, Brie. Jacqueline Petro's birthday was on September 7th, and Lisa Lambert's birthday was also on September 4th. So far, we have three people who have a September 4th birthday. Kate's birthday was on the 21st. Kelly Bergman's birthday was on the 2nd, September 2nd. Nicole Forrest's birthday was on September 1st. Joanna Sedatia Rod. Mm, I hope I said that right, Johanna. Or is it just Joanna or just Joanna? <laughs> Her birthday was on September 27th, which is actually today. Michelle Stanley's birthday was on September 7th. Amber Deesh was on the 22nd. Victor Hoya Patio was on the 2nd of September. Guys, let me know. Message me. 
like on Patreon if I'm mispronouncing your names because you know I'm bad at it. It's almost like a thing now where you just know I'm gonna mispronounce everybody's name. Eva Ramirez's birthday was on September 15th. Amanda Arthur, her birthday was on September 19th, but she also got a Havanese puppy. I love Havanese puppies. Both my, well, two of my dogs, Dak and Vale, who are barking now, they're both Havanese, but Rosie's a Morky. Jessica's birthday was on September 25th. Erica's birthday was on September 28th. And Stanislavia, oh no, Stanislavia Zalutkova was on September 15th. Stanislavia, can you make sure that you let me know how badly I butchered that? Maria Jones's birthday was on September 15th. Stephanie Sepulveda, Sepulveda, Sepulveda? <laughs> Stephanie's birthday was on September 17th. Elizabeth's birthday was on September 25th. Liz's birthday was on September 7th. Haley was September 27th and Ellen Vander Hayden was September 6th. Happy birthday to my September birthday patrons. I love you guys so much. I literally could not do it without you. So sorry to all my September patrons that I forgot to do birthday shout outs in September. A lot of my videos were pre-recorded and I was also um, just in super research Halloween mode. So it's just a lot of stuff slipped my mind. So I apologize, but I will be better from now on. Thank you guys so much for being here. I can't wait for the next Halloween video. Stay kind and stay beautiful and stay spooky. Bye!